So I thought I'd start with everybody just introducing themselves. Um, and um, I'll, I'll call you out and you can unmute yourself at that moment and then introduce yourself, tell us your film, and then maybe just answer the, the first question, which would be what inspired the film? So let's start with Aisha. Hi, my name is Aisha Salton, and I'm a columnist and features writer in St. Louis. I write for the newspaper. And what inspired the film is a series of editorials that I did asking the governor to grant clemency to five prisoners who I, um, after research that I did, believed should not be in prison any longer. And one of those people is Patty Pruitt. She's 71 years old. She's been in prison now for 34 years. And there were a lot of problems with the prosecution and conviction. Um, and that's what my documentary explored. Wow. I mean, that opens up so much. I'm sure we're all, because this is really just going to be an, an overall chat. So um, as people, as after we do this and we start in on it, as people have comments and questions, just raise your hands or do the little chat thing where you can raise your hands. And then we'll have people be able to speak up and ask you questions because I'm sure Aisha, we're going to have a lot of questions about that film. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so Jeremy, let's, let's, let's go next to you. Your film is the uh, On the Ride and uh, I loved it. I, I have to say, I just thought it was terribly moving. Hmm. And so, um, and also I have to say that I noticed uh, in your filmmaker uh, interview, you know, where we all got, had to send in our little video, that you had said you made it a point to not to have a lot of women and to have um, LGBTQ T and to have uh, minorities. And I was very impressed with that. But before we get into that, why don't you go ahead and just tell us again the name of your film again and what inspired you. Sure, uh, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you Breckenridge for having us. Obviously, I'm also here with um, my director, so I'll let her chime in after. Uh, I'm Jeremy Glazer. I am the writer, producer, and actor from that the short film On the Ride. Um, and what inspired me was I was craving to tell my own story because uh, I've been an actor in Los Angeles for quite some time and I wanted to be able to take the reins a bit more and uh, not just play a part, but uh, tell the story from A to Z. And um, one day I was uh, uh, just on Facebook and somebody posted a news story. Wait, uh, can I ask real quick, is this going to be shown after the films are seen or because I don't want, I don't want to reveal too much if... Uh... Well, we'll give that to our fearless leaders. Go ahead um, and tell us. I, I'm, rec I'm recording this. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm hoping, I'm hoping it will get on our website. Okay, I'll just say what the inspiration is. Yeah, so, I think it's fine. People uh, watch so, it different times, so you know. We, we right. can put a spoiler alert in there. Yeah, spoiler oh. alert, spoiler alert. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> it'll um, inspire them to watch it. Right. <laughs> So it was, I was on Facebook and somebody posted a, a news story about a man who rode about 1,200 or 1,500 miles on his bike to meet the man who now holds his daughter's heart, who passed away unexpectedly. And that basically just got me right out of my seat and went straight to the computer and just used that inspirational story to make it my own. And that's how it all kind of started. Uh, that was the inspiration. Wow, that is so cool. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Jen, um, tell us about how you and Jeremy hooked up on this project and, and how you got inspired by what Jeremy had written. So um, thank you for that question. So Jeremy and I worked together on my second feature film called Rust Creek, which won Best Feature at Breckenridge. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so he was, um, one of the detectives, well, he was the detective in the movie and, you know, we just had a great time and we hit it off and the film came out well and everybody's really happy. 
So, you know, everybody's on good terms afterwards. <laughs> and um, when Jeremy wrote this, he reached out to me to see if I would be interested because we, we had such an enjoyable experience working together. And I connected with the material instantly. And, um, you know, it's funny, people ask you at the beginning of your career, like, what do you do? And you're like, I don't know, I haven't done it enough yet. Um, but, but when you start making enough stuff, you, you start recognizing patterns. And one of the patterns that I see clearly in my work is a, an intimate connection between strangers. And as you know, that's a very strong theme in this. So um, I just, it, I, it, it really connected with me right away. Oh, that's, oh, that's so lovely. Um, and then um, Sonia, um, tell us again your film, Unmute Yourself, and tell us your film and, your, and the inspiration for it. So our film is AC, and I'm going to... I will let, acknowledge that we have Heather here too, so yeah, I Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let uh, Heather talk about inspiration because she's the writer okay. and producer, and then I can tell something about the, the process. That, that sounds actually perfect. That's just what we did with Jeremy and Jen. So let's switch over to Heather. <laughs> Hi there. And, um, uh, by the way, another film I just love. <laughs> Thank I you. Mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, coming, I come from the theater world. I've been a playwright for many years. And so, you know, just the whole theater vibe of it and yeah. <laughs> um, the, the clever idea of the AC unit talking. Um, maybe give a little bit, because you know, I think I think we got that from uh, from Aisha, but also tell us a little bit, everybody, about what the film's about. And so, in your case, it's such an unusual um, <laughs> idea. Go ahead and tell us what it's about, and then what inspired you. Okay, I mean, um, fundamentally, the film is about um, a creative person, an actress who's about to give up on her dreams of you know leave Los Angeles. And she gets an unlikely inspiration from something in her apartment. We've been careful to sort of tiptoe around what that inspiration is in our description. Um, but uh, spoiler it, alert. Yeah, spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, as a writer, as just a person, I've always sort of, uh, what is the word, anthropomorphized uh, <laughs> inanimate objects. I tend to think that everything has sort of a personality and living in LA and having a lot of actress friends, uh, just a conversation with uh, hearing the process of rehearsing lines and the sort of, you know, loneliness and, and you know, discouraging way of trying to make it in the business. And it just seemed like a very funny and offbeat way to get uh, ready for an audition and, and <laughs> prep the actress and take a totally offbeat out of left field sort of uh, crash course in acting um, yeah. that, you know, I think worked for her. I think she got the audition. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. Yeah. I, I definitely came out of it feeling yeah. like you did. And you, so do you therefore have an acting background? Heather? I do not, not at all. In fact, I'm even nervous to talk on Zoom. So <laughs> I definitely don't have an acting background. I'm strictly a, a writer. Um, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, we were very fortunate enough. Um, uh, I was so fortunate to bring Sonia onto this project. And with her came Jennifer Bartels, our actress, who I, I can't even imagine this little short having the energy that it did really without having her in place. Like, um, but yes, yeah, Sonia, Sonia liked the idea and she's a fantastic comedic director. And so I was just really lucky and I'll let Sonia take it from here. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, um, Heather and you met like a, some years ago when I came to the United States and we started, she came to my first feature film at the Outfest and, and we had an idea that night and we started to work in a, in a feature film. Mm -hmm. And between where we were writing this feature film, Full Party, she came up with this short film, AC. And I always interested in, in tell the story of people who want to pursue their dreams, whatever is and whatever happened. And that is the stories that I connect with. So I say, yes, and I have the perfect actress. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because I, I, I already worked with, with Jennifer and and we have like a, we were very lucky because we had Robert Frostman for the, um, for, to play AC mm -hmm. and he did a really good job. He was on set. That is something that I, I really want to have him on set uh, working with, with Jennifer because if not, she had to work by herself all the time and, 
And uh, yeah, I think it was like a very, very fun process um, to work in and, and to have fun. And yeah. Yeah, yeah I also but... want to mention that it what you know, it's a it's a store, 14 minute story that takes place in one room. So I think Sonia did an amazing job of keeping that creative. Um, and we had an actress who was talking to herself <laughs> the entire time. So it, it, it created some creative obstacles to keep, you know, the audience interested in those visuals and that. And I think Sonia did a great job making sure that happened. Uh, that, that was the, the most difficult part for me when I was like, oh my God, what I'm gonna do? <laughs> so, right. Yeah, because it's, it's difficult when you only have a room and a really small room. It's not like it was like, oh, I have like you know, an amazing living room. No, small room and it's 14 minutes. Now it's less, but <laughs> it was 14 minutes. And and yeah, but I mean, I think um, the script has this funny thing, this, this um, sensibility that I think is perfect to tell the story. Absolutely. And I know that challenge, my film before the, the, the one that I have in Breakfast was all in a very small office. So um, yeah. <laughs> and as director, I had to sit outside and be looking at the monitor while the DP was inside, you know, in this cramped space with the boom. And anyway, um, that's wonderful. And so now we have Amy, um, who is with One More Win. So Yours sounded like an interesting how you got into it, Amy. Um, I believe this is your first film, and then you also worked with a, a director from England. Am I getting all of that right? Uh, yes, you are. So One More Win is about a man named Rod Hall, who is a legendary figure in off-road racing around the world. And um, he and I met about 10 years ago. I read an article in the New York Times about this thing called the Gazelle Rally in Morocco, which was nine days without any electronics navigating your way across the northern parts of the Sahara and somehow thought from my living room in New Jersey, hey, that's fun. And it turned out that the man that was giving the lesson was a guy named Rod Hall. And we became friends. He became a mentor of mine. And I ran into him in, I guess, the end of 2015 at an event. And he was telling me that in two years, it would be the 50th time that he raced this one particular race, which is called the Baja 1000, which goes from the north end of uh, the Baja Peninsula nonstop a thousand miles down to the south end. And he's the only person that has raced every single year that race has been put on since the first one in 1967. And I had at that point known his history and known that he had all these really cool stories. And it just is a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous sport. It's, it's a beautiful sport. The, the scenery is amazing. And I just kind of had this idea in my head and I called him the next day and I said, Hey, Rod, I have this crazy idea. I said, how about you give me a shot to make a documentary that sort of will weave in your 50 years of history from the birthplace of a sport all the way through, you know, your attempt to set this record that nobody is ever going to have a chance to replicate. And he's quiet for a second. And then he says, you know, Amy, over the years, people have asked me, can I write a book? Can I do a biography? And, uh, you know, it's not really my thing. I'm not that interested. And I always said no, but because you're the one who's asking, I'm going to say yes. Oh. So I hung up the phone, did a cartwheel and then went, oh, shoot how the heck do I make a movie? Because I had <laughs> zero experience in that arena. Oh so it was a, it was a learning process and I had a lot of great people that I kind of was able to get in touch with and tell the story and they were captivated by the story. And I guess I was super enthusiastic and gave me a lot of good advice. And as we went into filming, um, Rod got some news about a health issue that was going to really change what, that year leading up to that race was going to be and even at the time didn't anticipate how much it was going to change and knew that the film itself was going to change and be less just you know biography racing history and more of sort of this human struggle that I, we were anticipating him going through and I knew that I kind of needed some help to make sure that I the story was captured the right way and treated the right way and brought in someone named Richard Healy who uh, directed several, six, I think six seasons of Top Gear for the BBC and has done a lot of automotive content in the UK. Um, not, it was his, this was his first documentary, but he's had a great level of experience and he really brought a nice touch to it and really just 
you know, was, was, I think, as honored as I was that Rod allowed us that access to be able to tell the story of, of, of those years of his life. So It was fun when listening. And I learned a heck of a lot. <laughs> oh, I bet. When listening to your oh, guys, um, uh, you know, talk on the, that we all sent in, that he said he hadn't heard of the driver and he hadn't heard of you. But by the end of the yeah. conversation, he was saying yes. So he was, a, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah, uh, I have a follow up question, but I'm going to ask everybody else a follow up question. But I already know what I'm going to ask you. Okay, great. <laughs> because I'm really curious about this. But um, let's say we've got everybody right. So let's go back, and I'm going to just what I'm going to do is just a follow up question, and then then let's open it up for you guys to ask each other questions, and that's when you can just sort of wave your hand at me. Um, so Aisha. Um, again, we're making sure I know who's doing, okay, 33 and counting. So my follow-up question is, what was it like getting to know this woman? And on top of that, getting to know her family, and did you get sort of embroiled in their emotional life in the process? Oh, absolutely, 100%. I mean, as a journalist and as a filmmaker, you do have to keep um, a certain amount of like, I guess, artistic distance. So you're making the right choices for the story, but I wouldn't be human if I didn't feel something. And I just, I'm, I can't get into stories that I don't feel something very strongly about, or certainly not a film because it takes so much. And <laughs> it takes so much to actually make a film. Um, so I'm absolutely heartbroken that Patty is still in prison. I don't think she belongs there. I think she's a remarkable human being that has faced extraordinary circumstances in a way that most people would not. And uh, the film incorporates a lot of voices of formerly incarcerated women that talk about how she's changed their life from behind bars. My ultimate goal and hope for the movie is, I mean, it's been well received at festivals and it's won awards, but it all feels a little empty right now because the reason, I mean, I'm hugely honored, obviously, especially by people to be in the company of such great filmmakers, but, um, you know, I want her to get clemency. I don't want her to die in prison. And she's in a prison in Missouri with a huge COVID outbreak and she's old and frail. Uh, and so part of me feels like, you know, I put all this energy and time and emotional investment in this film. And if it doesn't help move the needle on the conversation about maternal incarceration and the way we lock up women, disrupt families for generations, then I will have failed. Um, so I'm hoping that's not the case. Oh, God. I, I think for all documentary filmmakers, that is so the case that of that moving the needle that you just talked about is, is so much part of the, the motivation. Um, before I ask other people questions, I realized I hadn't said anything about my own film, which I'm having so much fun doing this, <laughs> which I really enjoy. Um, my own film is called Entwined. It is a narrative short about 14 minutes long. Um, it's basically the story of uh, two people who are standing in front of the same painting at an art gallery and they're in their 60s. One of them is black, a man, black man, and then there's a white woman and they're standing there looking act actually entranced by the same painting. And they realize after a moment that they know each other from many years ago, almost 50 years ago, when they had been boyfriend and girlfriend in high school until racist bullies had scared them apart. So this is actually the first time they've seen each other. And it was absolutely true love in high school. This, is a, this was a love that was meant to go on and it got truncated. So here now they're seeing each other for the first time in all this time. She's married, he's widowed. Um, they can't, they still can't be together. And what are the feelings that they still have for each other? And how do they heal what happened between them? So that's basically the story. When people ask what inspired it, it, it was inspired by several factors. I mean, um, 
you know, one of which was a friend had had an experience like this. Uh, she was she was a girlfriend of mine who um, who had in fact run into her old boyfriend, and she was white and she was black, and they had you know been ripped apart. It hadn't been quite as violent a ripping as what I portray in the film. Um, and then we were we were really uh, lucky to get. I don't know how many of you are Star Trek fans, but we got. Michael Dorn in the film, and Michael Dorn um, is Worf in all of the uh, Star Trek television series and films. And one of the reasons he said yes was because something very similar had happened to him, that he had seen a girlfriend. And in their case, it was the parents who had basically forbid them to be together. So um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in you know, this subject, obviously, these days, it's particularly, you know, pertinent, but the subject of, of getting past those damn barriers of, of, of race and any other differences that we seem to want to paste on each other um, unnecessarily. So that's kind of where that comes from. So moving on. Um, uh, so Jeremy and Jen, um, so my follow-up question for you guys is, um, you, you made a conscious decision to have, to represent, as I said, um, multiple diverse, diverse groups, including making sure, and I was just talking about it with my own film, making sure that the heart was given to an African-American young man and you have the the mother who answers the door, and she, and the closeness that happens between um, your character Jeremy and her, and that my favorite moment, if you guys haven't seen this yet, is when he he's studying the young man is studying to be a doctor, and he takes the stethoscope and he puts it in it in you know your character's ears, and you listen to the heart, and it's the heart of the man you loved, and it was just so touching so you i'm assuming that you and jen and this is for both of you that you made a very conscious choice about that to have this be to have this transcend race am am i correct in asking that and jen make sure you unmute yourself uh yeah i mean when i was uh building this right from the start um i wanted it to be about like Jen said, strangers, people from two different worlds, different walks of life that end up having to come together and saving each other in a, in a roundabout weird way without really even knowing it. And when somebody comes from a different um, ethnicity or race, it doesn't necessarily mean their lives are that drastically different. I mean, they're from the same town or, or same city. And, but um, I think whenever you come from a different, uh, whether it's ethnic background or uh, sexual orientation or, or anything you come from a different uh point of view and a different walk of life and i think you know not to sound trite or whatever you know we're all in this together and we're all we all can help each other no matter what where we come from so i wanted to kind of you know lift up the two different uh worlds by showing that you know they're from two different sides of town, there are, there are two different ethnic backgrounds, uh, two different uh, uh, sexual orientations, all of it, or genders, all that. So I wanted to have some differences without nailing it on the, over the head. And I think that's why it worked so well, because in that moment between the young African-American man and what's the name of your character? I forgot what his name is. Uh, the character I play was Scott yeah. Long. <clears throat> and thought and that, Roshan, yeah. yeah, the moment between those two did transcend because not only was it like you just said, transcending race, but it was that the heart that he had was the heart of the man that your character loved. Right, who so was also it, white. So it doesn't matter. We all have a heart. White? Exactly, heart. exactly. That's why it was all working so nicely because who was, who was gay and who was white 
And here we have probably a heterosexual African American man who is embracing that heart. And so it was just all very lovely. And and Jen, did you want to add to that? I mean, I think Jeremy really hit it on the head there. Um, I, I can I can speak to behind the camera, um, and that is that you know I think because obviously everyone comes from a different perspective, it's important to have different voices and different perspectives making a film as well. Um, and you know, uh, I I'm very active in the women in film community and um, advocating for women in the industry. So um, that just came really naturally to both of us. Yeah, and that's a big reason. I mean, A, I already, Jen was at the, my first choice, right, from when I, you know, was like, who am I gonna ask to direct this? Jen, you know, I, we work together, we get along so great. I love her work, everything. But on top of that, she's so um, active in, you know, with Glass Elevator and all these, uh, you know, women in film that she, you know, obviously had a plethora of resources with with women in film and and I also just wanted to make sure that we represented them we represented uh, everything as much as we as we could so that like Jen said it was just we want we're only we can only tell so much from our own experiences you want it from multiple and it was a really great collaboration I felt so lucky yeah sounds fabulous and I'm assuming that Jen you were the one who made who brought brought so many of those crew members that were were women <laughs> yeah because as jeremy knows i'm very particular <laughs> so um yeah, as she should I, be I, yeah. um, I, I i i it's very you know to me every person that you hire is just as important as every actor that you cast yeah. and um they can make or break your movie so um you know it, it's very important to me to to bring the right crew on yeah i love it i love it thank you and um so moving on to, uh, you know, I just realized we were missing the person from high country who was going to come on and he's not here. But any anyway, rate, moving on to one more win. Oh, Dale, he told yeah. me he wasn't going to show. I just oh, wanted, okay. I should have told you that earlier. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So yeah. I just noticed he's on this list. Um, so, um, so Amy, for one more win, um, my follow-up question that I had was, um, you were in a different life. I believe you were doing, you were Wall Street or something? You were working? Yeah, that was my, my original career. I was on a couple, Wall Street trading. Right. So here you are making your first film. Had you, did you have like longing to do films all through those years you were doing Wall Street? Or was there something that suddenly, while you're in one career, triggered this desire to move into another one? It was actually, I had, I had stopped working on the street when my kids were little and got into off-road racing because I do so you quite a bit of racing that, myself. Yeah. Yep. And at somewhere along the way, someone reached out to me and said, hey, it's really cool that you're doing this. You know, you, you came from you know, living a half an hour outside of Manhattan and, and you're now in the desert and doing all this crazy stuff. Maybe we can put together a documentary about what you're doing. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. And, and got a little sort of taste of the process. I wasn't so much, you know, tell a story about me because personally, I think it's kind of boring, but, um, and I'm always looking for some way to challenge myself. And I like to do things that are you know, maybe I'm, oh, you shouldn't be able to do that because you're whatever, or because you haven't done this and you haven't done that. And it just, the pieces fell into place. And I, I honestly had no idea that what Rod was going to end up going through was going to be so deeply personal. I just thought, you know, this isn't, it's action, it's exciting, it's beautiful, you know, the scenery is beautiful, the characters are amazing. I would love to have a shot at this. And just, you know, bullied my way through and just kept asking questions and just just doing it because the clock started ticking in this particular scenario. And um, now I found, I loved it and am looking for the next one. <laughs> I love that. I lo you know, I always call that the can I roller skate attitude, which is if anyone asks you, if you can roller skate, there's only one answer. Can I roller skate? You know, whether you can or not that's the answer I actually 
I, I have my own version of that, and, and I don't think any of us are really old enough to know the reference, but I call it the My, ha my Father Has a Barn from Our yeah. Gang, the Little Rascals, that black, oh, black and white okay. show from like, I don't even know, like the 30s or something that I watched. I don't even remember where when I was a kid. And there's yeah. an episode where they need to make some money for something. So they decide to put in a show. And one little kid goes, oh, my father has a barn. And he's just so filled with hope that because his father has a barn, everything's going to work out. And that's just kind of been my philosophy. It's like, I've got a great story. I've got a great idea. You know, just keep going, keep going. Have confidence yeah. that it's, you believe it's good and you're going to figure it out. So. Yeah, I have been in that position in many, you know, I mean, I never yeah. thought, first of all, I've been a playwright. So. I didn't think I'd be getting into film, nor did I think I'd be producing, nor, nor did I think I'd be directing. <laughs> All of these things sort of, like you said, they come and you're offered an opportunity or whatever, or you see the opportunity and you grab it. I think we're all probably like that. You know, it's probably one of the things you need to be as a filmmaker. Um, yeah. so, so Heather and Sonia, Sonia, where are you from? originally? I'm from Spain originally. I'm living in Los Angeles. You're from, from Italy, did you say? No, Spain. Spain, I thought so. Yo pensaba que estaba de, de España. España. Con un acento de España. Un acento de España. Acento, acento. <laughs> acento, acento. Yeah, I speak the, the, Spanish, the Latin American Spanish. <laughs> um, that was my original career. I was a Romance languages major okay. French and Spanish. Um, so at any rate, you guys, so did, because I know with one of mine, when I did it in a single room, it was for two reasons. It was because it had emerged from a play that had been in a single room. And it had e also, uh, you know, for budgetary reasons, uh, it's much cheaper to be in one location. So what were the factors for you that uh, that you decided that it was all going to be just in this one room with with an individual talking to herself, and either of you can chime in for that. Uh, well, I think it's uh, it comes from the script, so I think Heather can. For me, I prefer to have the <laughs> most rooms as possible. <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. as a director. But you did. But you got the challenge of having to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, I got a bathroom. I got a little bit of a bathroom. <laughs> Yeah, Sonia, Sonia added the bathroom scene. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Break it up. Yeah. So I, I don't think it was a, a conscious decision, like, let's create a short film based in one room. <laughs> um, it was just the story itself lent itself to that scenario. I mean, she's she is alone. I mean, there was no reason for her to leave her apartment or to be anywhere else. Right. Um, I think it was a challenge finding a location that we could make um, a single room interest that we could set cameras up to shoot from different angles. Something as a writer, I didn't even really consider, but uh, you know, after Sonia came on as a director, it became a priority when we started looking at locations to try right. to create it in interesting different shots. Otherwise, you know, for obvious reasons. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, the story itself just happened to take place in one location. It wasn't a let, let's try to make this more complicated for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've had that. I've had film, uh, plays that I've adapted into film that I've either kept them in maybe one or two locations, um, and then others like in Twine where I've expanded it quite a bit. Um, so I was curious in your case. Um, well, I think for now, with all this COVID situation that we have, it's a it's a great choice, right, to create yeah. plays in one location. Uh, maximum two actors. So I think that we have to go back to, to plays, right? The right. plays and start to bring in the plays and, and that is what we are going to be able to shoot, right? If you don't have a, like a huge... Well, background. yay, yay theater is all I can say. <laughs> because it's my, it's definitely a world I've been in for a long time. Um, so I'm getting, getting some great, great chat suggestions before I, we, I open things up to you guys um, from our fearless leaders. I'm just going to be calling you our fearless leaders. <laughs> Um, that uh, that are saying, first of all, they said, be sure to tell them about your film. I, yeah, finally remembered. Um, and um, they are curious about where everyone is and how we're doing through uh, 
through the uh, through COVID, what, how COVID is affecting your lives, guys. So let's just start in the same order we've been doing. Aisha, let's start with you. Okay, well, um, so I'm in St. Louis, Missouri, and um, I you know, haven't really talked too much about this publicly, but um, we have been hit pretty hard in our house um, with COVID. My husband is a healthcare worker, a very healthy, active person before, and was um, contracted a severe case of it, was like sick for eight days at home, and then in the hospital for a week, um, and has been home for a week and is on oxygen um, and has like got a pretty long road of recovery ahead. And then while he was in the hospital, I also tested positive for COVID. So I am now out of, uh, like I think me and the kids were in quarantine for, I don't know, more than 20 days because of the timing of it all. Um, but my symptoms were milder, but it was just still very stressful for both of us to have COVID at the same time. We have teenagers who are doing virtual school in high school. And uh, at the same time, my aunt, I grew up in Texas. My whole family's in Texas. My aunt and uncle got diagnosed with COVID at the same time. And my uncle is now in a hospital um, in very critical condition. He's older. Um, my aunt is okay, she's recovered. But um, yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a rough month. <laughs> I was in the middle of a third. Uh, I was in the middle of a new documentary project, which I feel very strongly about, and I just had to shut it all down for right now um, until we sort of get past this. But I'm I'm going to move my camera because like, I'm going to show you guys like in our dining room. I don't know if you can see this oh, oxygen tank. We have oxygen tanks and a machine. That, that was the machine I had to turn off earlier. I asked him if he could use a portable oxygen tank because it's pretty loud. It's like constantly running in the background. Um, and that, you know, my husband is like healthy, active person who was supposed to go hike a mountain that he does every year in Colorado with his friends. They were, that was the weekend they were supposed to go. It's the week he got sick. I mean, he's out there climbing mountains and now he can like you know, not go to the bathroom without oxygen on. So, um, so anyway, I did all of that said, I do want um, people to still take this very seriously. I think the fall surge is gonna be difficult. I think people have sort of let their guard down a little bit because we're exhausted and we're tired of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But um, we've been exceptionally careful in this house and we still got it um, and we got hit hard with it, so. Anyway, I do hope everybody stays safe and oh, I hope that we get past this and I can get back to the, the stories I wanna tell. And what's interesting too, Aisha, is that so many people still want to lay claim to the idea that it's only people over 65 or it's only you know people who, have, who are immunocompromised. And I've heard case after case like yours in which someone who's quite healthy you know, yeah. gets really hit hard. So one of my brother, uh, I have a, a brother who's a, um, a doctor and one of the residents in his hospital, he just sent us a story today. Um, she's in her thirties, an OBGYN resident and she just died. Oh so. God. Anyway, sorry, I don't mean to be a downer, but it's just no, been a whole it's month. The reality. It's the reality of what everybody to some extent or another, is, you know, is dealing with and I appreciate. Yeah. deeply you sharing yeah. the, your personal story and it is a story it's a it's a cautionary tale too yeah so um well let's um let's go to jeremy and jen and 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 tell us what your what covid ha how that's been influencing your life um well i mean i'm i've been very lucky uh personally um, I'm so sorry, Aisha, that you're having to go through all that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, thank God my family is okay. Uh, a couple of friends and family friends have contracted, but they are out of the woods. That uh, and, um, but uh, I've been very conservative. I haven't really been going out. I'm not getting on planes, and you know, I guess the worst of it me was just not going to these to festivals. And but fortunately for amazing festivals are still making it happen. Um, yeah. I mean, work-wise, it's pretty quiet. They're slowly, uh, productions are slowly creeping back because the, uh, they're learning from 
uh, success stories uh, of other productions that have succeeded in finishing shooting without people getting sick and um, and you know slowly because most of my work is acting so uh, audition here and there is starting to pick up um, but priorities have definitely shifted you know what's important and um, I've just been fortunate so I would say the only thing that's really that hit the hardest is just, you know, finances or work, but we're okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, hitting so many people. And um, are you having to do, I have two friends who I'm collaborating with on a potential television series and they are both actors as well. And they've had to do these, you know, rather sophisticated work at home you know, where they have to have the right lights and they have to have the right, are you finding some of that? Yeah, I mean, we're kind of, as an actor, we're kind of built for <laughs> downtimes. Uh, yeah. And, you know, self-taping and all that has kind of already, it was, it was already, already happening before all of this. So um, fortunately we're, we're kind of prepared for that. And even during all this, uh, another actor from uh, On the Ride, Brant Rottenham and I ha had a, a digital series that, uh, is also getting into other festivals. So we were going through all of post when the pandemic hit. So we kind of had creative projects to be focusing on. And we just yeah. shot another little short with, because of the fires out here. So we kind of used what was happening with the, the way the sky was and we used the lighting and we kind of ran out there with our N95s and took advantage of the situation yeah. and still just staying creative rather than, you know, sitting at home be wondering so overall we're trying to make the most of it that's i don't know i can't speak for jen but yeah excellent and jen for you um so like jeremy I, i've been really lucky um certainly compared to what's happening with a lot of people in this country um my sister is an er nurse on the east coast so it, it when this started that was really stressful um but it's actually given me a lot of hope because she hasn't caught it and she's worked in in three different er's with it so that tells me that if we follow the protocols calls, right. um it, it's not a hundred percent you know as as aisha as you said unfortunately any one thing can can um really put you in a lot of danger which i think is is really scary for people and um the 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 long-term buzz of uncertainty i think is you know just wearing people down um but no i've been very lucky uh, all of my problems are you know first world problems and i'm just happy to be healthy and um eager to get to back, back to work but that's fine understood indeed and heather um, well, my day job is actually, um, I'm a critical care respiratory therapist. So, um, <laughs> so I've seen COVID up close <laughs> at the hospital here in Portland, Oregon. Um, we were fortunate enough to not have, uh, the surge that other parts of the country have seen. We certainly have had our share of cases, um, but nothing like New York or, you know, other parts that really had these sort of cluster outbreaks. Um, so, uh, you know, business as usual <laughs> in my world as far as working, um, thankfully, uh, also my partners in healthcare, we were, have not been, you know, uh, we've both been tested negative thus far, which is great. Um, and it's just from, a, you know, being in the scene, it, it definitely, um, obviously there's certain demographics where people are more likely to contract it, but it is very, um, odd <laughs> the pattern of who are affected and who's not and who is seems to be someone that you wouldn't think is affected not to compare it to cancer certainly but you know people that don't smoke their whole lives who all of a sudden get lung cancer it's sort of like that sort of bizarre yeah. algorithm of the mechanism but um so uh, and Aisha I'm so sorry that you are so personally being hit by this I really my heart goes out to you I'm so sorry um uh, just, uh, you know, on a, a lighter note, it's obviously very disappointing, all of us as filmmakers, to not be able to participate in the film festivals this year. So, you know, I'm sure we can all commiserate on that. Um, but thank you so much for still hosting it virtually and trying to make something fun like this mixer happen. Um, so, um, 
but yeah, so I mean, in the downtime, it's, I, I, the distraction of Portland being shut down for multiple reasons has actually afforded me an opportunity to get a lot more writing done. <laughs> so there was a silver lining a little bit there, but hopefully uh, we will just get through this and, and all the other catastrophes on the horizon <laughs> and make it to 2021 in one piece. <laughs> um, <okay>. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Sonia. ¿Qué tal, Sonia? Bueno, aquí, bueno. Um, <laughs> y well, está en no, España. Está en España. Well, I'm in, in West Hollywood. Oh, well, that's not Spain. <laughs> and I say, I say está because I, I think it's a What is it in, because in, in, you, you use usted in Latin America, but you guys use vos, don't you? Two, yes, two. Well, two yes. for the familiar, but what's your formal? Sorry for the... Oh, the formal is usted. Oh, you do use usted. But only oh. for formal. I mean, you, you only do that with people older than you or in a other position than you. Yeah. Usually we don't use it. Yeah, That's in French you use vous rather than tu when you first get to know someone and so forth. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Um, <laughs> so, so you are not in Spain right now. You are in, in West Hollywood, did you say? Yeah, um, West Hollywood. And, and yes, I mean, I, I only can see my family uh, through Zoom on, on phone, so I can not fly there. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little hard. <laughs> I have to say that it's a little hard um, uh, just to know that you can't go, right? Yeah. So... Yeah. But well, um, I'm waiting. I was waiting because I I was uh, filming a feature film, and the, some of the investors stepped back when the COVID thing situation. So now we're waiting to see if we can resume production. And but everything is so odd. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm 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 finishing a project, a feature film that I had a long time ago in my mind for five years in my mind and. And I just finished, and it's a contemporary version of Don Quixote in the United States, mm -hmm. from from oh. Texas to to California, uh, cool. in a motorcycle. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with a with a Sancho Panza, who is a trans guy, run away oh, from perfect. home. Perfect. This is so, like I love this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had the opportunity during this five six months to to finish, you know, like the first uh, draft that yeah. there is giving me notes. <laughs> so, well, I mean, all of us are affected, but I think the best thing to do in life is just keep, you know, keep living, try to be happy, try to be positive, and try to use this time to become better persons and to try to reach other people and try to do things that we can not do when we are so busy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Amy? Well, in uh, northern New Jersey, where I live, we were hit with COVID early and hard and just basically battened down every possible hatch. You know, I have a developmentally disabled brother who was living elsewhere and he was with us for about six, four or five months. Um, kids were home, you know, everything just stopped. Yeah. And we uh, kept on, you know, not you just keep your head down you know didn't order groceries same thing everybody did and everything that i had planned you know work-wise involved travel so that stopped you know i had a i had a i was going to be following a the other the other end of the spectrum in off-road racing a, a 14 year old boy who was racing thousand horsepower tow free trucks and doing all sorts of other crazy stuff and i was going to do some pre-production work with that and that kind of stopped um yeah, and then we stabilized, you know, my brother went back to his apartment, my daughter's been so far still at college in Boston, my son's at school, um, was working on another project with a friend where we were uh, for a docu-lifestyle series that we were going to shoot in Spain, and we actually have pivoted that and are working on some pre-production stuff to set it up to shoot in the U.S., hopefully, maybe in a couple of months, um, and otherwise, you know, you keep wake up every day feeling like you want to complain about everything and realizing that you really shouldn't complain about anything in our household. Everybody's healthy. Everybody's okay. You know, Aisha, I'm sorry about what your family's going through and I'm sorry that you guys went through that and, you know, wish you all the best for a 
continued recovery. Um, and that's really, you know, not a lot you can do. So you just kind of make the best of it and hug everybody you can when you can. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, for myself, um, I'm one of the lucky ones, like Jeremy and Jen were saying that, um, you know, it, we're, we're, we don't have huge outbreaks in Santa Barbara. Um, and we, my husband and I are um, by ourselves. Our, our son is in his 20s, so he's living on his own. And, um, and so we've been healthy. We've been super, super careful uh, and to the point of paranoid. Um, <laughs> but yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, I advocate that more than, you know, the carelessness that some people have decided to, 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 to practice, but you know, every, each person makes their own choice about this. Um, so now let me ask fearless leaders, um, do we are now looking at coming up on the hour. Do you guys want me to ask that other question about, you know, experience in festivals or should I be wrapping up? What are you, what's your suggestion? I, I feel like it's going well. If everybody is game to stay on a little longer, we can continue the conversation. How do you guys feel? Thumbs up? Thumbs up everyone. Okay, and I'm cool too, so. All right, sounds All good. Right. Thanks for thanks for letting me know. So so the the last question that they had asked me to ask you all, um, and then we'll open it up is um, is what have other festivals been like, um, and I imagine that means what have some of the other virtual festivals been like, probably, but maybe even what other festivals this year that you have attended have been like, and I will actually start because um, I've had that experience as probably some of you have as well of starting out the year with a bunch of live festivals and then everything shutting down and then of course moving into a bunch of virtual festivals. So for me, I had a month in February where um, I had two different films out there, maybe three, because I have three that I'm sort of circulating. Um, and so I went, my husband and I were literally in February flying from one festival to another festival to another festival all across the country. And I thought, okay, this is going to be 2020 for us. This is what it's going to be like because I have the most number of films circulating. So that's what it's going to be like. And of course, I was about to go to San Luis Obispo Film Festival in March when the shit hit the fan, as we all know. And that one was the first one to turn virtual on me. And of course, it's been virtual ever since. As far as my experience with virtual festivals, it's been really mixed. You know, um, it's been really mixed. Uh, I was in Dances with Films in LA, which was incredibly well handled. It was, it was like they were on top of everything. And I was very impressed. The other ones, um, between that and, and here, breakfast have, breakfast have been mixed, you know, where some things were going well and other things were just wonky. Um, you know, of course, I feel like breakfast is doing a wonderful job as well. Um, so it's a, it's a real mixed bag. And yeah, and I don't, I don't, I think all of us are longing to get back to the life you know, we are so, because this is nice. I mean, it's nice to be able to do this. And it's nice to be able to invite people from all over the country to buy tickets to go see a, a film of yours. And that's great. But I can't wait to get back to. And now it's looking like it's going to be well into next year before that happens. And I have two festivals that, and this may have happened to you guys too. I have two festivals that were postponed until next year. But I'm now worried that even those, the, even the postponed dates are not going to be working because they're sort of early spring. So, all right, that's my, that then I, I'm, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Aisha, tell us. Um, no, oh, so are. all of the festivals I've attended have been virtual. All the festivals that we've gotten into have been virtual this year. I mean, there were a few that were supposed to be and then got canceled and, um, I think the conversations I've been able to have in smaller groups that I wouldn't have, people I would not have been able to meet had we been in person, I've like been a benefit. Um, the hardest part for me, well, there's a few things is I've never been able to see my film 
in a theater with an audience. Oh, and it's such a wonderful, and wonderful feeling. Not yet, not yet. Um, not yet, thank yes, you, Sonia, not yet. Not yet. One day, um, you know, we had set up a private screening in Jefferson City, the capital, with all, invited all the legislators and the governor um, in an independent theater there, of course, that had to be canceled. And I, I mean, just every screening <laughs> everywhere, of course, has been canceled. So I am just really looking forward to that moment. Having had films, a film prior in a theater and festivals and being able to see an audience react to it and connect to it, like it was unlike anything I'd ever felt. Yeah. Um, and this film also, because it's my last film was a narrative. And when you're telling a true story, there's like, it's a different, it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, and so the, and the other piece that's been difficult is I had hoped that I would have been able to talk to more people about dis distribution if, if I was in person at festivals yeah. Yeah. or I could have found other creative ways to screen it and talk about it. Like one thing that I did with a narrative short I did uh, a couple of years ago is I went to a lot of colleges campuses and I had a talk and a program around the short because it was very timely. It was about issues that a lot of people were interested in. And so even if it didn't get like, I mean, it's hard to distribute a short and this mine is 39 minutes, this documentary, but um, I had planned to go to law schools and talk about the issue of maternal incarceration. I'd planned to do a lot of that, which obviously I don't know when we'll be able to do any of that safely again. And I feel like when you are uh, talking about something, there is that audience, like interaction, that feeling with that audience, that intangible thing that is the experience changes you in a way that a screen, when modulated through a screen, does not, right? right. So right. I kind of want to wait. Like, I don't want to just, we put it on YouTube for a little bit, but then we took it down because um, I was hopeful that maybe the governor would take some kind of action, but he hasn't. And now he and his wife both have COVID. I hope they recover, but I hope they learn something from it. And yeah. Um, yeah. anyway, at any rate, uh, I will just say that I feel acutely the loss of the opportunity for some of the things that you really look forward to when you're in the process of making the film. Yeah. I totally understand. Jeremy. Or should we let Sonia, Sonia, I know you have to take off. Do you want to? Or do you have to take she... off, Sonia? I'm sorry. I didn't know you had a Oh, limit. no, no. She was just doing it in the chat. I just want to give her yeah, a chance. Five, five little... minutes I have to take off. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for letting us know, Sonia. Yes, please go ahead. Um. Well, I mean, we are very, very sad, Heather and me, right? We are getting in a lot of festivals and I don't know, but I mean, comedy, if you don't have the, the laughs of the audience is like, oh my gosh, but it is funny or not, you know? I know you don't, you, you don't get that feedback. You don't get that feedback. So um, on Sunday is going to be my birthday and a friend of mine is going to uh, organize like a, you know, like a um, small party with seven people and in a rooftop with um with a screening i think i'm gonna i'm gonna put <laughs> ac and at least see what <laughs> what people say right because yes. but yeah i mean but it's what it is it's what it is and i i really hope that we go back soon and but we have to enjoy this too right and and i think there is something in this for example this this conversation that you guys are organizing that we are close to each other then sometimes we are in this festival event that maybe we don't have the time to connect and and, and just sit and see and look at each other and under uh, to the eyes or uh, on the eyes right and and right. so well it has good things too yeah I, I agree with that sonia because i have noticed that when you're in the one thing that drives me crazy about live festivals is when the parties where you're supposed to be getting to know all your fellow filmmakers, but the music is so damn loud that you cannot talk to your fellow filmmakers. I cannot tell you how many festivals I have been to that have loud music at their parties. And I'm like thinking, wait a second. I mean, the music's fine, but you know, I want to get to know people. So take a note, fearless leaders, um, you know, good. because I tell you, that's always driven me crazy. And this is nice. I mean, this is nice that we get to look at each other, like you said, look in each other's eyes and, and really feel like we're getting a personal connection. I, I do think that's probably one of the biggest pluses 
of um, you know of, of of these virtual festivals. Heather, do you want to add to Sonia's? I uh, just um, I AC did make it into before the COVID lockdown a festival at, up here in Oregon that was wonderful and it was really thrilling to see it on the big screen, uh, you know, and to hear people laugh and. You know, it's it's quite. It, there's just no going around it. I mean, film is a collective collaboration. It's a collective experience. We're in a theater together, whether it's drama, comedy. It's so important the in-person experience. But um, so moving on to the virtual platform, which I hope will not extend beyond, uh, you know, perhaps into next year. Uh, I think Breckenridge did a wonderful job with their virtual. Uh, experience just to set up even chat you know chats like this with other filmmakers that definitely wasn't replicated in other virtual uh film festivals um you know and it's i think it's a first time experience for every festival to try to convert their entire festival into a virtual experience it's it's all new to everyone as filmmakers and as the festival throwers you know um but uh yeah but i i love this experience of being able at least to commingle a little bit here in our virtual cocktail hour <laughs> And I think I personally would love to get everyone's contact information or just an email of, of just this little group, you know, just to, you know, I uh, feel like we have some sort of connection here at this festival and, and watch each other's films and so on, you know, something that we would do if we were actually in person and in a, a yeah. conversation. I think that would be nice if everyone's up for that. I would be. So. I think that would be great. And I see that that our, our leaders are asking to take a picture of all of us. So before you need to leave, Sonia, let's make sure and get, are you guys going to do like a screenshot of everyone? Yeah. Okay. So go ahead and do that screenshot before anybody leaves and then we'll find out how to share emails and so forth. I'm taking down my chat. So everyone tell, just go like, Go one, two, Anybody three, else? and we'll smile. Okay. Oh, there, you're, you're back. We're not, we're not sure that our screenshot is working with the command. So if someone can take oh, just to back uh, up. It, it may be because I'm hosting. Are you well, host also? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm host and you're co-host. So I, I, we should I both take screenshots. I, I did a screenshot, but yeah. With, uh, yeah. Well, here, um, let me try one, two. Great. Thank you, guys. That way we have backup. <laughs> smile, everyone. OK. So Ooh, that I sounded have, like it took. <laughs> yeah, it took. Um, so how would you, as long as you guys aren't muted at the moment, shall, can you all send all of us one more follow-up email with each of our, um, it, does everyone want to share email addresses? Let's make sure. Do yeah, I, in, in the original email I sent, everybody was included, so, but I can reset. Oh, that's right, that's yeah. right. So if we all look so at. You all, yeah, you all have each other's email. Okay, that's right. I remember that now. So we do have each other's emails, which yeah. is great. So we don't have to do that. Um, all right, I'm going to just open it up just for another Five, 10 seven. minutes. Bye, and Sonia. <laughs> yeah, Bye. Nice, to you. nice to meet you. Bye, Sonia. Adios. 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 Vaya bien. Vaya. <laughs> okay, vaya con Dios. Vaya con um, Dios. So, um, so let's just this, just raise your hand if you have a, a, a question, a burning question for one of the other filmmakers. Just go ahead and raise your hand and we will we'll unmute or you'll unmute yourself. And don't be shy. I haven't been shy here, so please don't be shy. Mom, how did you find uh, your first experience directing? What was surprising to you? That's Amy for Amy, right? Amy? Sorry, I see a mom on your, yeah, on I your know. title. I know it's weird. It says a mom. Oh, Amy. I just realized I should probably fix that because that's not actually yeah. my name. People are going to start <laughs> calling you a mom. So, yeah. Like, who's a mom? Yeah. Um, I, I'm naturally bossy. So, <laughs> I think it was, it was okay. But it was, I mean, it, I was very upfront with the people that I was working with. And I managed to get a lot of people who had a lot of talent who cut me, and a lot of experience who cut me a lot of slack um, and were like, hey, you know, geez, maybe you want to think that should go over there and do you need this and we should make sure we have that. So I was very fortunate that way, but I loved actually, I, it was really fun to be able to take what I was seeing and sort of 
figure out how to make it go with what I was thinking in my head and, and capture everything and then be able to tell the story with it as it unfolded. And, you know, it, I probably spent a lot more time in edit um, than someone who's not a first timer because it took a while to get the story together in a way that made sense to people other than just me. Um, but it was, it was a great experience. It was really fun. Other questions? I must have asked all the questions. Well, I have a follow up for Amy. Well, maybe for the rest of you guys as veterans um, and also for Amy, I mean, I'm curious to know as a debut director, what, what you learned out of it and as from the veterans, you know, what are some of the things that are like ongoing things that you know and that are, you know, are truths in your profession? That's great. Go ahead and chime in someone. I'll have the, the newbie can go first. <laughs> I actually, um, I think I learned the power of a human story, if that doesn't sound too cliched, and that the it doesn't have to be big to have an impact. Mm -hmm. And what I found the most powerful moments in filming what you know Rod's story were the little moments, and those were the moments that people watched and they didn't just watch, but they felt. And it wasn't necessarily like a big explosion or, you know, a car taking off really fast. It was just a, a little moment when, you know, eyes shift or something like that. And that was, wasn't what I was expecting as much, particularly going into off-road racing, which is big and loud and dirty. And, you know, it really was the little stuff that was the most powerful. Um. Or uh, Jeremy, go ahead. Well, for me, uh, the just like since this was basically like my film school in regards to being a producer and a writer, because I acting is like I said been on the forefront for most of why since I've been in LA, which is twenty years. Um, but really seeing what kind of like I've been on plenty of sets and seeing all the different jobs happening, but I've been I was so immersed because you know from the very beginning stages of bringing on each of the crew and each and all that and just seeing how it is such a huge machine and how everybody's artistic process for their specific job is so vastly different and how it all contributes to make this one thing and to just fully trust uh, for people to, to let go and let them do their craft and know that it's only going to elevate it rather than trying to keep your hand on it or like, oh, I don't know, it's not really what I was imagining. But then it, if you actually let go, it really does make the film or whatever project it is so much more enlightening and, 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 and powerful because you really see like, oh, so they have to go do all that and create those documents and boards and all that. Like, I didn't even know that existed. And, and I, you know, I didn't know that you can do that and how, just the writing, the shooting, and the post are three different films. <laughs> so, and and really seeing how it all uh, eventually turns into this thing that was probably better than you imagined when you sat down to write it. So it's it's amazing to see all the processes all go into this one one big thing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think to piggyback onto that, that's the thing that I just keep learning over and over again is that it's a constantly creative process. It doesn't ever stop. And that, like Jeremy said, if you can get comfortable in that discomfort, you can really discover some really great stuff. And, um, you know, if you're lucky, the whole is better than the individual parts. And you find like happy accidents and I mean, I was really lucky. Sorry, Jen, I'm going to kind of toot you a little bit, but she's been such an incredible mentor through this whole thing because she, you know, I, 
I was, I was not shy about saying, look, this is my first time doing this. What, what do you think? And so uh, she was really patient and, and wanting to parlay the information so that we were the most prepared. And it was, it was, I just felt very lucky to have a great teammate like that. You know, it's funny because I can really relate to, to what you're both talking about. Um, for me, I was wearing three different hats and each of the hats had a whole different set of requirements. The producer's hat was all left brain. You know, it was all about putting the pieces together. You know, the only instinctual or intuitive part is bringing your crew together because, you know, you, so how do you, I have a no jerk rule. <laughs> you know, my no jerk rule is if I have two talented people and one of them's a jerk, I'm sorry, they're out, you know. Um, so, so, you know, gathering your team and making sure that they're taking care of all the details um, is, is that whole left brain experience. Writing the script is, of course, as we all know, who are writers, is, is it's, it's that lonely in a room by yourself very creative, very right brain experience. And then you move into the filmmaking. And for me, the thing I learned the most was um, the collaborative process, how important my collaborations are and my team members. Um, it's a team effort. And I have learned, I have a DP who is also my editor who I will now continue to work with as many times as he wants to work with me because we make a really good team. So the air, he's very technical. I'm not as technical a director. You know, I'm not all about lenses. I'm about working closely with the actors. Um, however, I'm very hands-on when it comes to the editing. So I'm over his shoulder with the editing and we're, we're going back and forth with every little permutation of the edit. But he, and I work like a you know, fine-tuned machine together. So what I've learned is you get the right team and you stick with that team once you found them because, you know, wow, like you did, Jeremy, with Jen, you know, when you find that, that's magic. Um, so that's, I think, the, the things that I've learned in the experience. And uh, Heather, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, as a writer, I mean, I've worked on other scripts, uh, mostly as a consultant, but um, so having, you know, again, you know, you're the writer, so you feel a somewhat, um, you know, possessed over the, the story to a yes. certain point, and you really have to hand it over, and it's hard to just hand over your story and vision, um, because it's, uh, you know, as a collaborative effort, it is going to be changed for various reasons, and you have to trust who you're working with that it's going to be changed in a way that's going to improve it. Mm -hmm. um and um you know working with uh especially in comedy a lot of the comedic players who would who are in this are also stand up they've done a lot of comedy so there's a lot of improv you know just naturally that comes with these stories so you know it's a very fine careful line to walk with making sure that your actors um they should be able to breathe through the role and add in what works, but just to sort of not, um, you know, you to trust the lines in the story and not, you know, improv too much where it starts to become a different sort of creation. That's one thing that I, is uh, just one of those sort of delicately handled <laughs> situations. But I mean, as far as like happy accidents, like Jeremy one, uh, mentioned, you know, on who, those of you who have seen my film, the post-it notes that were all over her place with all the inspirational post-it okay. notes. I mean, that wasn't in the original script. Um, oh. We were setting up hair and makeup or the off in this other apartment down the hall. Um, that girl's apartment was covered in post ah. notes with inspirational messages. And I was like, this is fantastic. So um, literally just sat down an hour before we were about to shoot and just blanketed our set with all those post notes. So it was just like a, a random thing that happened at the end, which of course I think worked really well, but yeah. <laughs> So well, it was wonderful. one of those wonderful things, especially again, when you have just a single, single set as a sure, yeah. <laughs> what you were doing with that is, you know, whenever you can, the rule of thumb is if you can, if you can do it visually, right. do it, you know, visually where you can, the dialogue, I'm, I'm very much about dialogue because mm -hmm. I'm, I tend to write dialogue rich things, but mm -hmm. 
when you can do it visually, do it visually. And so those post-it notes told us so much about yeah. our character <laughs> before, you know, we even really got, got rolling. So yeah, that, it was a great last minute addition, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so um, uh, I think maybe this might be a good time to, um, what do you guys think, fearless leaders? Yes, uh, I'd like to chime in here and just say, this has been so awesome, so wonderful and so special. And I'm just so happy that you guys all showed up for this little chat because I just love you all. I mean, just I just think you're wonderful. So um, thank, thank you, you for being here and thank you for submitting to Breck Film Fest. We wish you were here. We oh. wish you were here. <laughs> so and thank you to Dale for moderating. I really appreciate that. Thank you, that. Dale. Thank you, Dale. Everybody. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, you guys really, take really, care. Thanks so much. Ready. And we know how to get a hold of each other and everything. Yes. So, um, very so. good. Thank uh, you so much thank, for having thank us. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Bye. Great. Thank you. Love you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.